thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. It's always a great pleasure for me to get to give these talks and it's also a pleasure to see this icon in front of me. I hope it hasn't become something that uh, you're becoming indoctrinated into thinking of as a warning of boredom to come. Uh, to me, it always reminds me of the great time that uh, Nico and Jonathan and I had uh, working on these icons, simple representations of complex ideas. So once again, we're starting with this illustration by uh, Jonathan Anderson. And I promise soon we will see more of them. I know I've said that for a while, but it is actually coming soon now. Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about, if I can get the slides to advance, there we are, is the Johari window, and uh, or Yohari window, as a, a research colleague of mine over in Europe says. Um, basically, what I want to talk to you about is something that I think a lot of us are worried about right now as we follow the news and wonder what's going to become of us. Um, how can we individually learn the things that we don't know we don't know? Um, and can that be applied then to helping others to do the same? So um, let's start again with a review of what we've covered so far in these lectures. Uh, so we've reviewed the idea that we think at different speeds and the fact that we think at different speeds and that the faster, less thoughtful uh, processors in our skulls um, have emotional attachments to the decisions they make. Because of that, we get these biases uh, where the things that we already know uh, are weighted more heavily than the things that we have a chance of learning. And uh, that distorts our self-confidence, as we talked about last week, and our ability to test our own knowledge and uh, self-calibrate so that we have a better sense of what we do know and what we don't know. And uh, today, we're going to take that discussion further. Uh, once again, stepping forward by taking a step back and looking at those three different processors sitting in our skull. So to summarize it again, uh, and again, just a little bit differently than I've summarized it before, um, outside data triggers the fast reflexive responses that we have no control over. And those responses then trigger the strong emotional reactions uh, that then inform and bias our thinking. So that by the time we get around to trying to think rationally, we've got biases in place that we've created ourselves just because of the natural way that our brain operates at these three different speeds. Um, so given that this three part brain or triune brain uh, creates these biases in uh, how we learn and think about new things. And uh, given that that's the fact that it makes it hard for us to accept new, new information because of that fact, even when that information is about our own internal knowledge and our own internal skills, the things that we try to use every day. Um, but especially it limits us in understanding and accepting the things that we haven't even imagined that maybe we have to think about. Now, that seems like a kind of a heavy and unrealistic idea. So, um, it, I'll digress just briefly and ask you if you've ever, ever heard about that horse that lives in the river. And uh, there's a reason I'm asking you about that, but we're not going to get into it right now. We'll come back to it in a little while. Um, the simple truth is whether or not you know about horses and rivers, uh, we're surrounded every day by evidence of our own ineptitude. Every time you see someone who's vastly better at something than you are, that should be evidence that there's more you could learn. Whether that uh, thing that they're better at is a physical skill or a mental skill or an emotional skill, we're surrounded by evidence all the time that we are inept, we are ignorant. Um, truth is that that little protoprosimian uh, that's screaming in my skull all day long is just constantly trying to convince me that I am completely incapable of anything that I think I can do with the strange exception being when I am thinking that, you know, I could probably try that. Uh, and I'm thinking it about something that might actually end my life. Then that same little protoprosimian is screaming at me not to ask for help, not for, to look for guidance, not to make sure that there's somebody here who can maybe do more than hold my beer. Um, which brings me to another story. Um, probably you've heard some version of the story of the uh, old wise men who were asked to describe an elephant. Um, I mean, there's lots of versions of the story. Usually it's, it's uh, 
old wise men, because uh, so often in old stories, old wise women are called very differently and treated very differently than old wise men. But uh, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's four. Uh, usually the story involves them either being blind or blindfolded or in a dark room um, for the purposes of the story. And they're, they're asked to describe an elephant, these, these wise beings, and uh, they're unable to see. And uh, the result is, um, well, it's possibly predictable. Um, the story has been around for a long time. In fact, it's, it's been around so long. That's why it's hard to say whether we should go with the version with five or with four, uh, whether we should go with the version where they are blind or where they're blindfolded or where they're put into a dark room with something they don't know. There, there's so much uncertainty uh, about any story that you hear. Um, maybe that's a, a good place to look for some of the wisdom that uh, we've been talking about in this series of lectures. Maybe that is some of the uncertainty that we should be clinging to happily rather than unhappily, uh, as I've talked about the last couple of weeks. Anyway, what these uh, four or five people saw or believed they saw, what they explored with their hands and found was that an elephant was a whisk broom and four tree trunks and a big rough skin tent and a boulder and uh, two sheets of fine cloth and uh, a, a, a coyote or a rabbit stick, like a, a hard weapon that you throw at animals, uh, and a snake. And if you haven't heard the story before, uh, I'm sorry if I haven't told it in the most humorous or insightful sense, but the basic idea was that these people each had their own perceptions and trusted their own perceptions. And none of them really trusted the perceptions of the others. In fact, none of them even, depending on the version of the story, none of them even thought to ask the others what they perceived. And certainly in every version of the story, none of them teamed up to combine their perceptions into a single perception, um, which is sort of the key point of that story. And uh, at this point, I'd like to take another mental uh, journey with you like we've done in, in uh, these prior lectures. Um, and again, we're going to go back to the 1950s, um, this time a little bit differently. Um, last time it was a cocktail uh, party we went off to. Uh, this time instead, we're going to something at least as fun as a cocktail party. Um, it's a, a conference of academic psychologists. And, huh, let me tell you, that's fun. Um, and if you don't think so, well, then, you know, some of us climb some kinds of mountains and others climb other kind. And, uh, anyway, I, I promise you, conferences can be really cool. And uh, the thing about conferences is that if you've never been to one, uh, and if, if you've been to one and didn't enjoy it, maybe the problem is um, that there's lots of different kinds of things going on, and you can get your pleasure from the different kinds. So there's the big uh, capital T talks that are going on. And those are really fun to deliver and sometimes fun to, uh, to uh, receive in the audience and sometimes not. Um, then there's the small tea talks, the, the conversations that go on in groups or between individuals, and, and that's, that's wonderful. And then there's this informal sort of non-conference uh, stuff that goes on, uh, self-organized meetings and things like that. And to me, that, that's often where the best information comes forward. And I want to tell you a story specifically about that. That's why we've gone on this little mental journey. Uh, the Western Training Laboratory out of uh, the University of California, Los Angeles, used to have these uh, group development conferences. And uh, they'd go off to Ojai. And uh, one year in particular, and I can't tell you which year, that's part of that uncertainty in stories. Um, every record that I, I've found of it uh, names one of three years. And no one year is named more than the others. And uh, that that's just seems to be how the story has gone. Uh, but certainly you can find people who cite with absolute confidence that it was in one of three years, um, each one of those three years. So they, they were having this group development conference. And um, one of the cool things they did there was that at the end of each day's sessions in the conference, um, the organizers would ask a couple of, uh, a couple of senior people of different backgrounds to get together and hammer out a summary of some of the issues that had come up in one particular session or in a pair of sessions or in some really cool discussions that everybody had gotten wind of. So people would get together, uh, usually it was two of them, and they would create these summaries um, just as a way of having a discussion the next day that could bring more people into this idea. And uh, 
uh, for one particular session, it was a, a medical doctor called uh, Ingham who was working at UCLA and a, a PhD in psychology called Luft who was also, uh, well, he was trained at UCLA. I think he hadn't yet moved to San Francisco, but he, he later moved to the uh, uh, University of San Francisco and finished his career there. Anyhow, the two of them were asked to sit down together and come up with a summary of some cool work that had been going on, um, specifically in the psychology of social interaction. So the two of them went out and did some social interaction between them. They uh, apocryphally, they, they uh, went and sat on a, a tree stump with some uh, sheets of paper and, they, and a, a, a marker and they, they drew out a basic description of the kind of model that they would have liked to have had. Models of uh, social interaction and psychology go back a long way, even in formal studies. Uh, Piaget was creating them in the 1920s, and, and they, they go back further than that in, uh, in uh, um, other countries' uh, versions of science, uh, earlier uh, versions of science. Um, but basically the concept is that you look at the whole person in relation to their interaction with other persons and persons is deliberate there, um, other individual people, you could say, or groups of people. But um, So this, this, this interaction between uh, two folks is what they were trying to model, and they came up with, well, no, it's not that model, I'm sorry. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get past just which model we should be looking at these days. Uh, the, the model that they came up with is, is a different kind of model. I, instead of having um, uh, time on one hand and, uh, and uh, uh, a number of uh, infections that have spread on the other. Uh, in, instead, here it's a model of uh, others' knowledge against our own knowledge, which is kind of a nifty idea. Um, let's take it a bit further. Uh, if you want to look at something as vague as my own knowledge, um, you could. It's hard to have a scale, right? I know a lot. I know a little. I know some. How do we? How do we have a scale there? The easiest way to have any kind of a scale of measurement is to make it binary. So you can say, I don't, or I do, no. And it's as simple as that. We put a line down the middle, and we can say, own knowledge is divided into the things I don't know and the things I do know. Nifty, huh? Then we could do the same thing with others' knowledge. We can say it's divided into things that they do know and they don't know. Now, if an engineer is looking at this, then they would just know for a fact that the intersection of the two graphs, that point is zero. So others' knowledge starts with the know nothing and moves towards know something. And own knowledge starts with knows nothing and moves towards knows something. Um, these guys, though, were psychologists. No offense to my profession, but um, that's not how they did it. Instead, they created this idea of two axes making these four windows, starting with something that is known to self and unknown to others, moving upwards from there, known to others and known to self, or moving from known to both down to something that is only known to self and not to others, and then moving across something that is known to others but not to us, and something that is known by nobody, not us and not others. And they, they specifically use this model, they specifically use this model, uh, Dr. Luft and Dr. Ingram, to talk about the interrelationships between people regarding um, their knowledge of one another. So you could use it to chart out one person's knowledge of another person and their knowledge of each other focused on one. And you can use it to check it out the knowledge of each other focused on the other person. And that's sort of where they had it. Um, in later years, um, they went on working in this and uh, um, the model has gone very far. Uh, it's used a lot in businesses for very different things, uh, very different, much more complex things that only vaguely relate back to the original model. Um, it's used a lot for understanding personalities and personal interactions because of different personalities or events. There's a lot of stuff added to it, um, uh, some of which is really, really quite interesting. And I, I can provide a link later to the work by uh, one chap, uh, Bergquist, who applies it to practical coaching and got some really nice insights. But that, that's another matter. The point is that Dr. Luft and Dr. Ingham, or Joseph and Harrington, uh, created this model overnight and uh, or uh, one evening and then they presented it the next day uh, as part of the summary and uh, that was it they were done they had a little task to perform together they didn't really work together otherwise they made their presentation they went their own ways and then about a year later uh, about a year later uh, at a conference one of them was approached by someone saying hey can you show that uh, Johari model that you guys developed and he was like Jahari model. I, 
don't know what that means. Well, what it means is that Joseph and Harrington's rough sketch had come to be known as the Joe and Harry model by people who were there that day and witnessed their presentation. And over the course of that year, between the original presentation and the approach at this other conference, over the course of that year, the model had uh, come to be known as the Johari model, or Johari, as my friend in Denmark says. Um, basically, the way the model works is this. There are some behaviors and feelings and motivations that I share with the public. And there are some that I keep to myself. I don't share them with the public at all. By a similar token, some of the behaviors and feelings and motivations that I have, I'm completely unaware of. But those around me know them. Oh, he always does this. When this happens, he always does that. This is something he's always concerned about. This is something she always avoids. And then, in the fourth box, we put the things that nobody knows about, not the person I'm talking about, whether it's uh, my, my work colleagues or one particular work colleague or a spouse, uh, and not me. Um, and so these, these four different boxes of experience or of uh, understanding, you could say levels of understanding or levels of knowledge, these four different boxes arranged together do look like the frames of a window. And so the Johari model is often called the Johari window. To, to phrase it a little bit differently using the words of, uh, of uh, Dr. Luth, um, the stuff that you present to the world and share with everybody, that's your public self. Whereas the stuff you keep private and put like a facade between you and the world, that's your private self. The unaware self is the one that others can see but you can't see yourself. And then the potential self, your potential is all of the stuff that you don't know even exists. And the person you're in relations with about this also doesn't know they exist. And that's a really cool idea, isn't it? Especially if we tie it back to what we were talking about the other day, um, that I, I, idea that uh, it's harder for us to learn things we don't know already. We have a bias for the things that we already believe we've known longer, even if that length of time we've already known them is very short, even if it's microseconds. Let's take a look at that a little bit through this Johari window. So if, if you do want to think of it as a window, you could say that that first one, the public self, that's when your window has the curtains open. And uh, when you close the curtains on some things, that's your private self. Then the things that I don't even realize I'm sharing with the public, but the public all sees, that's when I think this window is a mirror and I'm like fixing my hair or something. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, and everybody's watching and thinking, what the heck is going on? And then sometimes we don't even realize that the thing we think might be a mirror or a window or a wall is actually a door to a secret room. And that's where all the potential is for the things that we can't even imagine we should be imagining. To put it in a more uh, 21st century context, a more 2020 context, a more May 2020 context, we could say that uh, the public thing is a Zoom meeting and that uh, the uh, private thing is when you're at the Zoom meeting, but you mute your microphone and turn off your camera, uh, which of course we all do only for good reasons, uh, like you're all doing now, thank you. Um, then this other one is when you're not aware that you're still in the meeting. You think you've hung up and your camera is on and your microphone is on and everybody can see you puttering around the kitchen and realize that you're actually not wearing trousers. And um, yeah, that's, that's the stuff where others are aware and you're not even though their awareness is of you. And then um, I guess the fourth window would be something like that. Um, so again, coming back to this idea that some things are uh, unknown to others and others are known to others and that some of those same things are known to ourselves and not known to ourselves, uh, we can break that down a little bit and uh, reduce that back to a graph again like we had before and um, think about a lot of things flowing through that process. And uh, as I said uh, last week, and as I've reminded you of once already, but I wanna stress that we have this pride of possession, this feeling of, of proud ownership of the ideas that we've had for a little while, uh, just because of the way that our brains work. We've got that, we, we spend this time thinking that that's so, and we have a certain amount of doubt automatically in any knowledge that's presented by the world or by other people that contradicts 
the knowledge that we already have or that tries somehow to supersede it, whether it's a direct contradiction or an overriding or saying, hey, yeah, you've got a good understanding of a pencil, but did you know it has two ends in the middle? Um, th those kinds of changes are really hard for us, hard for us to deal with because we have doubt. And I, I want to use the Johari window now to try and show how that might be. Imagine now that we're looking at the, the window, the panes in the window, not in terms of your understanding of me, but I'm looking at it to try to understand you. Okay. So for instance, I know that there are feelings and motivations that you share with the public. And I know that I do the same thing, that what I share with the public is not the same as what you share with the public. I know that. But what I know about you is what you share. But I also know that I have things that I don't share that are deeper. And if for some reason, like say the fact that I'm processing with a, an emotional fast reacting protoprosimian instead of with a logical uh, prefrontal neocortex, um, if for some reason I believe that you don't have that deeper knowledge, well then automatically now I know more than you do because I know what you're sharing with the public and I know things you don't know about me. So automatically I know more than you do. And we could take it further and say, I also know things about you that you don't know. I not only know more than you do about me and all the stuff that I know that you don't, but I obviously know more than you do about you and all the stuff that you interact with. Obviously I do, because I can see the things you're unaware of. I can perceive that. So automatically I'm thinking, wow, I clearly know more than you do using this model of, of how we know each other. And if there are some behaviors and feelings and motivations that I might acknowledge that neither of us know, usually that's where modesty comes from, right? That, 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 that feeling that uh, there are people who know more than we do that I was mentioning at the beginning of the lecture. Usually that comes from that context. That, but there are things that neither of us know that are, that are bigger. Um, but do I really believe that? Does the proto-prosimian in my skull really acknowledge that there's a greater world of knowledge that neither of us know? Maybe the proto-prosimian only acknowledges that there's a tiny little bit. There might be some few things that I don't know. Um, I'm pretty sure that I could build the Sistine Chapel, and I bet if I took my time, I could paint that nice painting on the ceiling. Yeah, there might be a few things about doing that. I don't know. I, I, I haven't built a scaffold before. That could be hard. Again, remember what we talked about last week, the two filters, the filter that takes all of the massive noise and filters it into a stream, and then the other inverted filter that turns that stream of noise into things that we can anticipate hearing, right? Everything we hear is based on what we expect to hear, whether it's because we're scared of it or because we're anticipating it uh, in joy rather than fear, or whether it's because it's what we know this person always says, um, or because we've heard the song. I know the song. You don't have to tell me the lyrics to the song. I know that. It's, uh, excuse me while I kiss this fly, right? I've, I've heard that lyric. I know what it is. Oh, sorry. Be free. Um, real world exposure to our own limitations, as I said last week, induces the uncertainty that allows us to learn new skills and allows us to self calibrate. Right. So we know those two things exist sort of contradictorily or in a, a juxtaposition that's hard to explain. But because of that, we know that learning things that are beyond our knowledge requires the participation of others who are willing to disagree with us. And that, that's a weird idea, this idea that people should be supporting us to learn more by being willing to disagree with us. Now, willing to do, disagree with us and intractably, I mean, without changing your mind, the willingness to disagree is is really important. Uh, doing it politely is really nice. Um, if you and gravity have a difference of opinion about how quickly you should be able to um, run down a hill without tripping, um, gravity won't necessarily be very polite in explaining that to you. But if you and a coworker have a disagreement about the same thing, it would be good if the coworker could disagree with you in a way that allows them to still be comforting to you whenever the results come about, whatever the final result of your disagreement with gravity is. And uh, like last week, now this is starting to look like a pattern, really, the last couple of weeks. This could be a perfect time 
uh, to introduce the, uh, the scientific method, which I, I do plan to talk to you all about. Um, but uh, while it could be a perfect time to talk about that, what I'd like to talk to you about now instead is this idea that we can yield to our own uncertainty so that the others around us can learn to yield to theirs. It's, it's a hard concept, this idea that we should all be vulnerable in order to help others be vulnerable. But these days, as, as we, we've encountered at, at work and as we are all encountering every day uh, with whatever media you're allowing into your lives and whatever other people you're sharing your lives with, we are all in a precarious situation, like what I, I talked about in the first lecture, we're all on edge with anxiety and grief. And that anxiety and grief has two contradictory results. We all feel uncertain about just about everything in our lives right now. It's just, it's how we are. We're uncertain. How are things going to go? But because of the way our brains work, when you're really uncertain, an unconscious response to that is to act with certainty, to claim some control over the world by acting certain of what's going on. It's as though that little protoprosimian is screaming uh, at herself, fake it till you make it, fake it till you make it, a, a phrase I particularly hate. Um, now, when she's screaming that to herself, it's possible that she is going to learn that she's wrong. It's possible she's going to learn it by running downhill too quickly. But it's possible she's going to learn it in a way that tells her that it's okay to be wrong and that she can learn to learn, that she can see these things that are beyond her knowledge and accept that they are beyond her knowledge and try to learn more about them. It's very hard for the, the protoprosimians in our skull to do this. But if, if, if we support them in doing it, then they can learn all kinds of things that go against their regular ideas, the ideas that they feel are better ideas because they're more ingrained and can learn to take on new information and possibly accept that as good ideas. But she has to learn that from her own experience. It, you, you can't learn that in a lecture. You can't learn that by having it presented to you unless your learning is entirely based on faith. In which case, like I said the other day, that's a very different kind of learning. She can't learn it from you or from me. There's a big opportunity for us to watch this happen. And uh, right now, all of us in our day-to-day -day lives are making those kinds of fast emotional decisions, those uninformed decisions that can hurt us in the long run. It's a big opportunity. And yeah, this time I do mean to show this model and I'm, I'm sorry to show it, but as I discussed with you a few weeks ago, I believe that we're currently somewhere around here on the curve with no end to the climb in sight just yet. And if you're wondering why I believe that, then please, uh, you can go back and watch uh, the earlier lectures where I discuss it in detail. I won't bore you with it now. But if, if I'm right and if this is what's happening, and I, I shouldn't say if I'm right, if the experts that I listen to and try to be informed by are right, so that what I'm showing you here is right, what I'm sharing with you, not something I've conceived of is right. Um, if this is so, then we are faced with a massive learning experience that's about to take place where a whole lot of people are suddenly going to be in a situation where they are either having their minds changed abruptly or they're faced with pressure that's forcing them to choose between strong, emotionally defended beliefs and new information that's right in, for, in front of them. And that just adds to the tension of day-to-day -day life, that adds to the tension that we're faced with all the time and creates a volatile situation. It's easier to talk about it on a smaller scale and on a smaller scale, we're all presented with these ideas every day. And all of us have this opportunity every day to help someone come to grips with the things that are contradicting their beliefs and to help us all, to help each one of us individually see that there's new learning that's possible and comfortably possible and that it's okay to change your mind and see that you don't have knowledge or that you don't have skill, that you long believed that you probably did and that it's okay. 
and that it's all right to acknowledge that and that it's actually better to acknowledge that because then then you can develop those skills that you want. All of us coming together that way allows the people we try to help to become more of the person they want to be. It improves their self-calibration. It improves their ability in the end if they take on new learning, whether or not they take on any particular piece of new learning, they can take on the ability to self-calibrate accurately and to have a better sense of themselves. And that allows them to become better at trying to improve themselves in the window they don't share with us and trying to improve themselves to be the people they want to be. And, and helping people do that helps us do the same thing. But it's a choice. And if we choose not to help our fellow uh, proto-Chrosimians learn to accept that not everything is a panic and not everything is certain, um, if we don't help them come to understand that their current certainty is wrong, that their strongly felt ignorant opinions, they could have long-term effects. Which brings us back to that horse who lives in the river who I mentioned earlier, because frankly, that was getting a little heavy there for a minute. And goodness knows I don't want to talk about heavy things. So the horse who lives in the river, have you heard of the horse who lives in the river? The horse who lives in the river was named by someone who was absolutely certain that he clearly understood the animal that was being described to him that he had never seen. Uh, apocryphally, this is the story of the uh, Greek explorers who came back and were describing unseen, previously unseen animals uh, to their leaders and rulers. And uh, this is why we have all kinds of fantastic beasts um, in uh, some of the old maps and those beasts entered into mythology. Uh, these guys rode the horse without having to use any external equipment. Uh, actually, these guys were half horse is, is what it clearly was, things like that. But no, that's not the case here. Uh, this is this uh, river horse. Um, whatever it was the person saw, what they were describing was obviously a river horse. You don't need to tell me more. I'm certain I understand exactly what you mean. I've seen horses. And I've seen rivers, and what you're describing is a river with a horse in it. Done. Thank you very much. Obviously. But how do you say horse from the river in Greek? Well, it looks like this, and it's more or less pronounced hippopotamus or hippopotamus. Yeah, somebody who didn't know what they were talking about gave a name to something they had never seen based on their previously existing mental map. And the result was that we've got a ridiculous name for a creature, which is a really important lesson again. Because those of us who aren't thinking about what might be in that fourth Johari window, those of us who barely want to think about uh, the fact that there might be some things that other people see about us that we don't know. That there might be some things that other people know that we don't know, just like we know things that they don't know. That the world isn't all just shared information where everybody is either acknowledging it or not. Those of us who have a hard time dealing with those different kinds of knowledge and the fact that different people experience different things, they are making decisions right now that could outlive them. So I'd like to encourage you all, please, during these strange days, to try to be slow in forming your opinions about all of the small things in your life. Don't worry about the big things. Those are big things. Try to be slow about the small decisions. Try to be slow about the small reactions. Try to be slow about opinions that you form and try to be quick and understanding that other people have different opinions, even if they're based on the same data and even if they're based on different data. In that way, you can try to understand yourself better, not just the world and not just others, but yourself and the world and others. Now, if you'd like to do that some more, if you'd like to practice your self-calibration and to practice others 
and to help others practice the development of their own self-calibration and ability to learn that there are things that they aren't even aware they don't know, then I encourage you to do so. And of course, like always, if I can help you with that at all in any way, please reach out. Thank you very much. It's been lovely talking with you today. I'm going to uh, seed the floor, as we say. <laughs>